So at this time, at this time, we're going to transition into the open dialogue, and I'd like to start it up. Well, because I'm the moderator, I have the power. Uh, with, uh, with just asking, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll toss a question over to Sean, and uh, and then you guys can maybe go from there. So uh, I'll start my clock, and here we go. On your view, both of you gentlemen, uh, what's at stake here this evening? And I'd like to ask a question, what if you're wrong? Hmm. I think it's an easy answer. If I'm wrong, I need to change to Matthew's view. If he's wrong, I need to change to mine. <laughs> what's at stake are the teachings of Jesus. Are we going to follow it? Number one. Number two, what did he say? So let me ask a question back for you. In Matthew 7... Your ex-Jesus that you use in this book, where did it go? Here it is, on my lap. How to talk about the Bible and LGBT inclusion. By the way, $10, $14 for shipping. Well, You're okay. killing me. <laughs> You're killing me. We nor there's normally an option for $2.75. I missed that USPS, one. USPS, but we've had some issues with that. We're working All right. on it. All right. Yeah. So Consider it a donation. Let, let's stay on topic, gentlemen. So we will, we will. So your first argument, which I talked about, is citing Matthew 7, that because of experience, we need to go back and reconsider Scripture. Where does Jesus teach that we are to evaluate biblical teaching based on experience? Well, Jesus is teaching in Matthew 7. Is specifically, he's talking about false prophets or exactly. false teachers. I just think that that principle has a natural applicability beyond that because I've never seen a Christian teaching that destroyed people's lives that was a good okay, Christian so, teaching. Okay, so, so slow down. Right. This is not what Jesus taught. Jesus You're teaches saying, the principle. Jesus teaches a different principle. Jesus teaches good fruit is obedience and bad fruit is lack of obedience. That's what he said. If you're going beyond it, you're reading in a principle into Jesus that's not there in the text. Am I right? No, I just think we have a different interpretation of it. Okay, so why is my interpretation wrong then? Why is the interpretation saying you can evaluate teachings of Jesus based on somebody's experience? Why does the text say that I'm wrong in my interpretation? Because we both said we gotta look at the words of Jesus. And I don't see him saying that. Matthew 7, Matthew 3, John 10. Where does the text say that? So describe to me again Refresh me on your argument here about, so you're saying fruit in your understanding of the text is only about obedience and has nothing to do with what Galatians 5 calls the fruit of the spirit? Uh, we can go to Galatians 5, but it's not just me. I have a ton of commentaries I pulled off. I couldn't find one that disagreed with me, not that I read all of them. So it's not my interpretation. The standard interpretation when you look in the context is Jesus saying, you can judge a prophet by its fruit. Good fruit is when the prophet's message causes somebody to turn and repent. Bad fruit is lawlessness. The verses after that say that. In fact, John the Baptist gives the exact same phrase in Matthew 3, verses 7 through 10, when he's saying he's speaking about repentance, and then he says a good fruit leads to repentance. That's the clear context. So why am I wrong on my exegesis of Matthew chapter 7? That's what I want to know, sticking strictly to the exegesis. Well, I just suppose it's a question of, does this principle have a broader applicability? And to me, that's a, it, I, I believe that it does. If you don't, that's fine. And I think there are other, you know, this is, to me, what I tried to do in the opening chapters of my book was offer what I saw as three different warrants for a reconsideration of this topic. So I do think that the harmful, destructive impact of the church's rejection of same-sex relationships is something that should matter to us. Of course, in, I agree it's, it's 100%. It's something that should matter to us in asking whether we've read the text correctly, but it's not my only warrant for a reconsideration. And so if you disagree with my interpretation of Matthew 7, I mean, that's okay, that's fair. It's fair for you to disagree about that. but. I also talk about, you know, this is, this is why I kind of put forward, um, I think there are multiple warrants. And another one. Okay, so slow down. Let, let me stick to this before okay. we go on. Because it's not just about interpretation. You have to point me back to the text and say why your interpretation better explains what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7. I don't disagree in principle. 
if we look at the lives of LG, LGBT people, and it can be proven that it's actually the biblical teaching itself that causes that suffering, which is something I wouldn't well, I would say the interpretation. Back to that. Right. Okay, now I would agree on in the interpretation. Then we should look at it. That's fine, but that's not a teaching that Scripture says. Jesus never said that anywhere in the Gospels. What he said is good fruit is repentance, bad fruit is disobedience. So it's not about somebody's experience. It's about the objective teaching whether we obey it or not. So it's not an emotional or experience, it's a moral principle. So you're welcome to bring in that principle, but don't use Matthew 7 if Matthew 7 isn't supporting the thing that you're claiming that it does. That's my only pushback. If we're gonna care about the words of Jesus, we got to go right back to the context and see what he said. So it seems to me you have two options. Either stop using the first example in the book about Matthew and say, this is a principle that Jesus didn't say, but I think it's a good idea, or show me why my exegesis is wrong. Well, I guess I don't understand why you don't consider the fruit of the Spirit to be good fruit. Well, let's go to Galatians 5. Sure. <laughs> so here's what's really interesting about Galatians chapter 5. Uh, where is this? Genesis, Exodus, Galatians. <laughs> Galatians 5, verse 16, okay? So, by the way, we've moved out of Matthew. We've moved out of the Gospels. We're now into Paul. So not that it's not relevant, but in terms of exegesis, you start with the book itself, then you move to others like it, and then outside. So we've gone far on the rung of exegesis, so to speak. If you read 5.16, it says, but I, I say, walk by the Spirit, you know what, gratify the desires of the flesh. 5.16. So he's contrasting being filled with the Spirit mm -hmm. with the desires of the flesh. Skip down to verse 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, which is porneia, which would have been understood as a variety of sexual sins, including divorce, it would have been fornication, and it would have included homosexual behavior, impurity, sensuality, etc. That's the verse right before. Through 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies. This is verse 22, contrasting this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, etc. And then 24 comes back to it. It says, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what is Paul saying? He's saying you have a choice to live in the Spirit, or you have a choice to live in the flesh. If you are living in the flesh, which involves sexual immorality, then you are not filled with the Spirit. So sure, somebody who's not a, a, a Christian or what else can have, or a same-sex relationship, can have some of that kindness. I would never say that. I'm not saying that somebody in a same-sex relationship doesn't have kindness or goodness within them. Please don't hear me saying that for a second. But Paul is saying, if you're involved in sexual immorality, then by definition, you are not living filled by the Spirit. So even when we go outside of Matthew and we go to Galatians, it says the same thing, that fruit of the Spirit is not somebody's experience. It's tied to obedience. Just if we stick to the text. Certainly love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are all things that we do experience, right? You wouldn't know sure. joy if you didn't experience joy. So I don't think we can completely extract this from people's personal experiences, but also your point about sexual immorality is true, but it also kind of just gets back to our fundamental disagreement because I don't think that all same-sex relationships constitute sexual immorality. I, you're right. Exactly. That's and so that's question. why I would be interested in understanding more about like, do you, would you agree with me that the Bible does not talk about same-sex marriage specifically? Okay, so can I come back to that? Before okay. Before we leave, we, we leave the text. I'm not dismissing the question. I think that I is the, the first, textual question. I think I have the first 20 and then you have the last 20, right? Isn't that yeah, how it works? Yeah, that's fine. You Technically, can that is that how it's supposed to be? Wait, who has what 20? Well, we didn't, we didn't divide it that oh, way. Oh, I thought we did. I'm sorry. Time. All right, no. never mind. Okay, on, on this text, let me just push back, then we'll come to okay. your question. I was like, okay. you don't want to answer my question, Sean. No, I... <laughs> Not too quickly, okay? Okay. Yes, people experience love, joy, peace, and patience. I grant that. I would grant that people who are non-Christians can experience some of those things. Just because somebody has some of those characteristics doesn't mean that person is filled with the Spirit. Yes. 
So if we flip back and look at this, what Paul distinctly says, if you are engaged in sexual immorality, then that means you are not filled with the Spirit. Yes. So that seems to undermine this idea of judging a tree by its fruit with somebody's experience. If they're in disobedience, that's a bad root which results in bad fruit. I'm not going to rap, which means the tree itself. Is that sorry, a song? Root and root. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. So I lost. Sorry. Do you, do you see the point? Yes. I just think you're kind of presupposing something that is a matter of disagreement, which is I don't think that being in a same-sex relationship in and of itself represents disobedience. You do, and so that's how, why you interpret it that way, but I don't. And so I think you're asking me to kind of follow a logic at a point where I can no longer follow it. And so that's why I think we actually, we, eventually we have to come back to talk more just specifically about same-sex relationships and the biblical text. Okay, so we can go back and we can talk about that. We can bring it in. But the question you would at least have to concede that the Bible doesn't teach. You evaluate something by its experience in somebody's life. It's repentance or non-repentance. Because it seems like we've taken a road and what we disagree over is whether or not sexual immorality includes monogamous same-sex relationships. Okay, we have to establish that that's not what's in mm -hmm. view, okay? But to get there, you've kind of agreed with me that Matthew actually is teaching that obedience is bad fruit, right? Oh, you just, you just don't think- Disobedience certainly is bad fruit. We just have a different opinion about what constitutes disobedience with this topic. Okay then, then you need to get rid of this example in your book because you just conceded my point. I, you conceded the point that I'm not fruit, tracking with you. Okay, look, if the point in your book that you use, example number one, is that bad fruit is leading distinctly to unrepentance, okay? It's not somebody's experience read back into the text. Bad fruit is what leads to unrepentance and disobedience. Correct, are you with me? Are you with me? The bad fruit is what leads to disobedience. Because you just said sexual immorality is not disobedience. I mean, I, I certainly agree with you about disobedience being bad fruit. I just think you have an overly narrow frame for saying that's all that bad fruit can mean. And, and I does, think where sometimes- Where does the text say that? I would get, go back again to Galatians. I think that's the clearest explication of the totality of what good fruit is for Christians and how we can know what good fruit is. Okay, so let's move on to your next question. Okay, your yeah, next I just think question. we, yeah, I don't, yeah. We can, I think we're beating this one to death. No, I would be, I would be interested in reading more but, about what you're coming from. I'm not sure I completely understand your okay, critique. Let me sum up but, and then you come back okay. to exactly what sexual morality is, okay? So your teaching is what you've said distinctly is that we judge a tree by its fruit, the experience in somebody's life of living out teaching. Correct. Is that right? That's one way. I would say that's important, but, okay. but I would qualify that and say it's not just how someone feels, because our feelings are too subjective, but, it's, but specifically what the Bible itself calls the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, Jesus isn't speaking about the fruit of the Spirit in this passage. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying bearing good fruit of repentance. Well, he doesn't so say you're reading of that repentance in, specifically. You're reading that in. He doesn't say it anywhere. So you're reading it in as well. If he I'm doesn't not, specifically I'm not reading say it in. of repentance. I'm saying he's speaking about repentance. Clearly, lawlessness and obedience is what Jesus is saying. None of those are words that he's using in this text, though. Look at the verse right after it. 23, he says lawlessness is exactly what he says. Uses That's the word not the text I'm talking about. It's in the context. You can't just isolate a text out of its broader context. You have to look at exactly what Jesus is teaching. I don't know. I honestly do think that you are, ironically, reading a little bit into this text to say, because in other texts of Jesus or John the Baptist, you know, he's talking about lawlessness or disobedience, therefore that is all that good fruit can be. I don't, I don't see that specifically in verses 15 to 20. So if I'm guilty of reading other verses into it, I'm reading Matthew 7, the verses below, Matthew 3, and the Gospels. You're going to Galatians and bringing something in that is bookended by contrasting the flesh with the spirit and distinctly says, do not engage in sexual morality. So I'm not the one who's bringing it in, I'm reading it in its context. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. 
Now you pushed back a question a minute ago. Let's talk about that. Okay. You're going to push back and say, go yeah, ahead. Do you, do ask you it. acknowledge? I'm, I'm going, Do you agree with me, or do you acknowledge that the specific topic of same-sex marriage is not something that is ever addressed in the Bible? No. 